Jasmine, take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. I'm really excited to uh, introduce uh, Shiva Tole, and in the interest of time, I will just pass it on to, to her. Okay, hello. Thank you so much. This is such an amazing series. I, I mean, I've loved, enjoy I've loved hearing the speakers before me. Uh, I just have a small little slide, and then mostly I'll just talk. Um, so this is the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, where I work. Um, uh, just a brief background. So, so we're right by the Arabian Sea. Uh, it's kind of beautiful. A uh, brief background. I did my bachelor's degree in life science and biochemistry uh, from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. My master's and PhD are from Caltech, uh, postdoc at University of Chicago. And then uh, my husband and I, we always wanted to return to India to contribute to the science and research in India, in the country that sort of shaped us and trained us. Um, so we returned in 1999. Um, at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, where I'm in the Department of Biological Sciences. It's been now 20, uh, almost four years, uh, 24 years. Uh, currently, I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies, and I take great joy in sort of shaping student programs and uh, um, mentorship and sort of um, thinking about and investing in uh, improving student life. Um, so I will now stop sharing and just talk. I'd like to sort of uh, talk a little bit about my journey only in that uh, I think in hearing different stories and different types of journeys, um, young people can find their own path and sort of maybe realize that, you know, every, every journey is unique. So it's okay if uh, our own path leads us in two directions that we've never thought about before, because almost everybody who's had a rewarding life has had something unusual uh, that they encountered, overcame, benefited from, took advantage of, and so on. Um, so uh, starting out, I was always interested in physics and biology. They were my rival loves. Um, it was the late Professor Sam Wog uh, when I was in high school, 12th grade. Uh, he described how an embryo constructs itself, a single cell creating a whole organism. And that level of complexity just did it for me. I think I think in biology itself, and perhaps across the natural sciences and even mathematics, people choose to work at that level of complexity that they are willing to find incredibly fascinating and not, oh my God, it's a royal mess. Uh, just to set up a contradiction. So the institute where I'm in, uh, we have physics and math and many disciplines. Uh, the theoretical physicists invited me for uh, a talk about brain circuits uh, early on when I was a, a new faculty. And I described the messy visual pathways and how we perceive things and so on. And at one point, um, one of them said, mm, do you have a brain with just two neurons we can study? <laughs> so this just, this just illustrates the point that people work at that level of complexity that they can find refreshingly sort of challenging and not a royal mess. So people choosing their systems or indeed their disciplines, I think you might relate. Um, so, well, so it was biology then for me. Uh, my mom I, uh, thought that I might be a doctor. It was sort of her dream to be a doctor, but financial constraints prevented her from doing so and uh, um, unfair, uh, unfortunate family situations. She became an occupational therapist and actually took that profession to the most creative heights I've seen. I'm currently putting together a book about her work. Um, and it's quite an emotional process. Uh, she, she passed away 10 years ago. Um, my father appreciated my sort of physics-y, fix-it um, um, mentality and thought I would become an engineer. And I chose basic sciences instead. Um, Caltech was a new world with an entirely, you know, inspiring set of uh, opportunities. I had no research experience. So there were some struggles. I had never even made buffers before. Um, it was a kind of swim or sink situation. And I sort of realized that research is like that. At the end of the day, you're accountable to yourself. And uh, if you get stimulated and, and um, if you find that challenging or the process of discovery challenging, um, then that's the profession for you. And otherwise there are a lot of other professions that can be very rewarding. So I think each of us has to decide whether we find this self-setting of goals and uh, you know pushing the boundaries of truth. Um, if that is what gives you know, 
makes our lives worthwhile. Um, I had wonderful peer mentors. I'd like to mention Karen Allendorfer, who joined as a postdoc when I was an in-stage PhD student. Um, it was wonderful to sort of exchange stories with her and um, the stock. Um, in fact, we carried on this friendship and professional relationship uh, through my postdoc, because when I joined Liz Grove's lab in Chicago, I was the only person in the lab. And scientifically and intellectually, it was lonely. So Karen and I started a phone journal club. Uh, we would actually discuss papers and even books on phone. Um, so I'm trying to say that, you know, one makes networks and, and uh, wherever one can. Um, many postdoc grants got rejected until some finally didn't. So there's always, uh, there's always, uh, you know, you keep at it and you keep at it and you take input and you believe in yourself, but um, try different, different journeys and eventually something works out. Um, and then when I got my job at the Tata Institute, I applied for the Welcome Trust Senior International Fellowship. I think I was the youngest person to get that fellowship. It was the first year India was included in its um, um, in its in its um, sort of eligibility criteria, and that um, that gave me the flexibility to really take on challenging problems. Um, how much time do I have? You have a, a few a few minutes. So you can, you can uh, keep keep going. Okay. Um, what we took on led us to the discovery of a signaling center in the middle of the brain. Uh, for the non-biologists, this is like a lighthouse, which um, sits in the middle of the brain, like where my fingernails are, and signals to the naive cells, boats that are around it, where strong signal is interpreted in one particular type of cell fate, weaker signal in another cell fate. So the gradient of signal allows a sheet of uniform cells, boats, to distinguish themselves from each other and unveil different genetic programs just because of this lighthouse and the signals from it. So essentially what we did was we created multiple lighthouses where there should have been just one. And we showed that the hippocampus, the learning and memory center of the brain, is where it is because this lighthouse is where it is. So that was a blueprint of the brain kind of problem. That was our, our aha moment. Um, a bragging moment would be that we actually published in science uh, out of India. So this was something that I still get emails about from people you know, all over the country, which is uh, you know, to contribute. Some, so so I, I was the first person looking at how the brain develops. Uh, the vertebrate brain develops uh, in India. So it was the first lab of this in this field, and now there are a few of us. It was extremely rewarding. Um, my um, institute and my department was really supportive. Uh, we fought fires together. We're still fighting fires together. Um, we had the flexibility to sort of solve problems in creative ways. Uh, the Indian word for this is jubgaad. Uh, look it up. It, it, it's, it's quite a solving things with what you have at hand. Um, when PhD students were limiting, I started a master's by research program to allow people opportunities to do a master's by research in India who would otherwise just go abroad directly for their PhD. So these young, talented people contributed to Indian science for some time before they left. This program is our flagship program. Um, in all this, I also juggled well lab management um, and two boys who are now 21 and 17. Um, we, uh, my husband and my boys went on two sabbaticals. Uh, we spent a year at Stanford uh, when the boys were three and seven, and then half a year in Geneva, University of Geneva, uh, when they were eight and 11. So this was, this was enriching. It was enriching for us as a family, enriching scientifically. Um, so now um, I have a, a full lab PhD students who contribute, who are colleagues, whom, whose successes I greatly enjoy. Uh, I'd like to share uh, one page from my lab's website. We have a page of lab quotes where funny things that people say are showcased out of context. For example, bro, pluck it like, like an eyebrow. You can only imagine. Or there was no signal in our brains. Uh, or, um, yeah, some risque ones, because when you work with mice and breeding, I'll teach you sexing. 
how to tell whether an embryo is a male or female. And sometimes we're fascinated by the neuron glia cell fate witch. Um, we forward each other proposals. And this one is uniquely, it's based in Indian mythology, in the mythology. I was dissecting at a microscope and I announced, because there were many, many embryos in front of me, that I have nine heads. And one of my students was heard to mutter, that's just one shot of Ravan, this, this demon king who has 10 heads. So, so this is sort of the personality of my lab. Um, and I will now wrap up my story and there's time for questions. Happy to take some. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we, we, have, we have a little bit of time for, for maybe one or two questions. So for, from, the, from the chat, uh, she asks, um, there's such a strain of, of defiance and improvising and, and Duga uh, to, to make the best of, of your circumstances in all of the stories that you've shared. Uh, is there a special source of inspiration that you draw from for these? A special source of inspiration, I have to say it's my mom. Okay, my mom showed by her example that you shouldn't let your job definition limit what you do in life. So she was an occupational therapist in India. That's a lowly position. Uh, you answer to the real doctors and so on. She, she was creative. She created supports and aids and appliances to help um, um, amputees with one hand braid their hair and roll out chapatis. She created, she created things to help people. And there was no limit to what she could do. There was seriously no, no limit. So I would just look at her thinking, you know, what is her job really? It seemed to be everything. So I pass this on to students. I tell them that your syllabus doesn't limit what you should learn in life. That's the lower limit, not the upper limit. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think everybody here is, is just really inspired by the kind of resourcefulness and industriousness that's kind of pervaded your talk. Thank you so much.